It's Grandma. Time for another story from our hometown scrapbook by Ben Witherwax. Today's story, The Schaefer Brothers. Hello there. We're going into the scrapbook tonight to find the story of a family. A family that has been associated with Grays Harbor since the pioneer days. And the family that has contributed much to the building of this place we live in. In one respect, it's not much different than the story of most of those pioneer families that settled up this stretch of big timber country. And in another respect, it's altogether different. For it's the story of three brothers who knew big timber logging from its bull team days down to modern times and who rolled with the change and left a heritage of chips and sawdust lore for their children to carry on their work. It's a big tree story that unravels with the years and connections today with yesterday in a way that explains much of what Grays Harbor has become. And so, after Dick Crombie has had a few words from our sponsor, we'll be back to tell the, you the yarn about the Schaefer Brothers and a half a century in the tall timber. The year was 1870. And Olympia was not only the capital of the Washington Territory, it was one of its principal cities. The boat from Vancouver, B.C. docked one evening with some newcomers on board. Among them was a family, John Schaefer, his wife Anna and their son, Peter and several half-brothers and sisters of his parents' former marriages. They had traveled all the way from Wisconsin via San Francisco. Now they were headed for homesteading country. John left his family in Olympia while he built a scow on the Black River. When it was complete, he filled it with provisions, all the things that homesteaders would need in the wilds of western Washington. And he started downstream. He made smooth waters of the Black River without difficulty, but had gone only a few miles down the tricky Chehalis when the scow piled upon a submerged snag and turned over. Down to the bottom of the river went the precious stock of irreplaceable necessities. Pork, molasses, flour, bedding, axes, seed, a stove, everything in a, the homesteader's world. It would have been tragedy to anybody. But John Schaefer showed a strain of determination that has become recognized as a family characteristic ever since. He righted the scow, salvaged the cargo, and pushed on. Most of the cargo was still usable. The flour, except for a crust around the outside, was free of for moisture. The range was salvage complete. The tinned foods were still usable. The pork was dried and saved. Once again under way, the scow continued, manned by its single crewman, to the mouth of the Satsop River. John Schaefer made a, a recognizing from this point on and upstream beyond the first forks. He found a spot to his liking. There were settlers below, but at the spot he selected the soil was rich, the land level and the hills rickolied and prickolied with wood. He filed claim on 160 acres. Before he returned to Olympia, he constructed a house of logs and split shakes with an earth floor. Then he went back for the family. It took a four-horse team and a big wagon to move the family with all their possessions. The road wound along the Chehalis, past Blockhouse Smith's place, and was a two-day trip. It ended at the rude log cabin that was to be the first home of the Schaefer family in Grays Harbor. It, is, it was said that John Schaefer was probably the most unfit person who ever set himself to battle the frontier. 
He had been a language professor in Germany, a college professor. But what he lacked, his wife Anna more than made up. She was a true pioneer. She directed the clearing of the land, sowed the fields with her own hands. She managed the family's finances and worked from early in the morning to very late at night. Meanwhile, the family grew. In 1873, Herbert was born, and in 1879, Albert came along to complete the trio of brothers. They came into the world that was beginning to take on a new form. Down the valley, a town called Montesano now boasted stores and a hotel. Further west, there were settlements later to be called Hopewim and Aberdeen, but those markets were too far off for the produce from the Schaefer farm. So Anna Schaefer decreed that there should be a road built through to Shelton, and the Schaefers undertook the task of building a highway through the vid virgin timber of one of the heaviest growths. They built the road, and when the eggs, butter, and cream had accumulated, Anna Schaefer, usually with a couple of her children, drove the 35 miles to town to trade the produce for salt, sugar, flour, and coal oil. Parts of the road are still in use today, serving the area around Matlock. A school was opened in the Schaefer's milk house for the Schaefer's, the Gleason's, and the Kesteronson's who got in a few weeks each year at the three R's. But the Schaefer brothers were going to school in a practical way, and they were growing up in the midst of the finest stand of timber in North America. As sawmills began to hum at Montesano, at Aberdeen, and Hopewim in the late 1880s, Peter and Herbert talked about starting a logging show of their own. But John and Anna were against it. It was risky. Neighbors who had tried it had gone broke. They could cut the trees, drag them to the river, but they couldn't pay the crews needed to drive the logs downstream to the mills. Let's let the trees grow, they said. They eat no hay. So it was 1893 before the boys managed to sell their idea of logging the home place. Peter was then 24 and Herbert 20. Albert was a strapping 14-year-old itching to swing an axe. They were told that they could log some of the timber, provided that they got old Ben Kesterson to coach them. Ben was an experienced logger who had gone broke trying it himself, and further providing that the farm should not be neglected. It was so agreed. Under Ben, Kesterson's supervision, they built a logging road and divided up the job. Peter was the bullwhacker to drive the team of oxen. Herbert was the faller, and Albert was a hook tender. John Minkler was hired to hewn the rides, and Ed Kesterson, Ben's boy, greased the skids. Schaefer Brothers was in operation while the rest of the country worried over the Cleveland Panic and Aberdeen and Hoquiam's waterfront were being beginning to roar with the sounds heard the length of the coast, up and down the Satsop Valley the big voice of Herbert bellowed the familiar cry of the faller, Timber! And Peter learned the chant of the bullwhacker. The great sight and sounds of logging in the biggest timber of, on earth filled the young days when the cold deck beside the satsop had been stacked with logs the the whole drew turned to and rolled them into the streams there was no money for heavy equipment john and anna schaefer had decreed that their sons would not go into debt if they would log they must do so with the tools they had on the farm until they had made enough money to buy the equipment they needed Strong backs and long arms rolled the timber into the river that September of 1893 when Schaefer brothers went into business. But they weren't done with the farm. The Schaefer brothers were up at four in the morning to do the farm chores before they started the day of logging. 
They did the evening chores when they returned from falling and yarding their timber. Their skid's grease was to be rendered from the fat from the butchering they did. And when it ran short, the brothers bargained for 200 pounds of butter that a farmer had been saving for a higher market that didn't come. And it turned rancid and was bought for a bargain to keep the skid road slick for the big timber. Throughout the winter of 1893 and 94, the Schaefers logged. Their crew ate at the farm and ate well of the hearty meals Anna prepared for them. When weather prevented logging operations, the boys worked on a pair of dugout canoes. They were ready, readying for the spring drive or mending the pike poles. It was March, with the sats up at the top of its banks, that the Schaefer brothers started their first log drive, the one that was to be the first of many. Rafting their logs at the Chehalis, they brought them down to Aberdeen where A.J. West bought them for $2.50 a thousand. Their scale was a half million feet. The pay was in 90 day paper, which meant they could collect in three months. But it was the first logs brought from Satsup to sell at any profit at all. The brothers were elated. Jonna and Anna were pleased with their success. They laid out a program of expansion about which Anna had something to say. Buy and hire all you wish, but borrow nothing, mortgage nothing, and pay for what you get now. And they did. The boys continued to farm and log. Each year the market got better and each year a supply of Shaper Brothers logs came down the Chehalis to the Aberdeen Mills. But there were bulls to shoe. Pete was a blacksmith in the family. The farm was now a stopping point for trappers and settlers bound for further up valley. And other changes had to come. There was now a post office and a school that, taught, that was taught by a young man named El Eldridge Wheeler. The camp had outgrown the Schaefer farm and a bunkhouse was built. With each season, more men were added to the crew and the spring drive grew larger. In 1897, more than two million feet went down the stream to the harbor's mills. That was the year that John Schaefer died and was laid to rest on the, in the family burying ground on the home place. The brothers' combination was inactive as such for two years while Herbert took in the gold rush in, the, in 1899. He was back to face a new problem with his brothers. Donkey logging was coming in and they had no money to buy a donkey. After talking it over, Herbert decided to go to Seattle and take a job at the Washington Iron Works. He explained to the management when he applied that they needed a donkey for their woods operation and he'd like to work and learn how they were made and operated. All but a few dollars for living expenses, he asked them to apply to the purchase price of a new donkey engine. Back home at Satsop, the other brothers worked on the farm as hard as they could, converting their products to cash. It took them 18 months to make it, but when they dumped their accumulated cash on the desk of the machinery company, it was a good big down payment on their first donkey engine. From that day on, Schaefer Brothers were donkey log loggers. Stuart Holbrook, eminent Northwest writer, and whom we are indebted for much of the material for this story, notes that by today's standards, the new donkey engine was a toy. It was a 9 by 10 loader with one drum, and with it came a drum of steel cable. It arrived in Satsa one day in the 1900s and was floated on a scow up to the Satsa to the Schaefer's home place. It was a red letter day for Satsa, and for that matter of fact, the entire county. The little logging engine was set up in the barnyard at the farm, and the admiring loggers gathered around it. Herbert, who knew his donkey from whistle to firebox, explained its working parts. 
In the days that followed, the crew turned to and built a sled. And when it was built, the engine bolted down. The 9 by 10 was ready for a trial. With Herbert at the throttle and Albert super, superintending, a medium-sized log was hooked to the line. Slowly, very slowly at first, Herbert opened the throttle to let the steam do its work. The drum spun and the line became taut. Then Herbert let go and the engine shirred into a rhythmical sound that is music to the ears of a donkey logger. The log tossed and turned, slipped over the ground and came to stop six feet from the donkey, the first steam-yarded log in the Satsap country. Now, Dick, it's time for you to break in with a few words from our sponsor. Well, that little 9 by 10 did yeoman's work for the Schaefer brothers. When logs jammed along the river banks, they moved the donkey downstream so the banks could be cleared. One year, the main drive piled up to the gravel bar just above the bridge across the Satsop on the main highway. The big timber locked itself into a snarl for four miles back upstream, and the river began to fall. Unless something was done at once, the drive might be held up until the next fall, maybe a full year. The little 9 by 10 began a mad dash for the jam, pulling itself along it snorted down one bank, then the other, and arrived just in time. An axe hung on a safety valve, and its firebox crammed with dry fur. It was le leaning on its lines. The crew went to work at once. With Herbert at the throttle and the donkey snagging out one key log after another, they cleared the jam, and the drive was saved. Forty years later, Peter Schaefer recalled that if the drive hadn't have been cleared, it would have been a staggering blow to their growing business. But the Schaefers, as those who know them will recall, were ready for anything. Lack of skid grease, shortage of capital, high water or low water, they took what came and ran their logs down the stream to make their business grow. Our time is up for today. We'll tell you more about this team of harbor loggers and how they switched to railroading and went into the lumber business. A short story that has a prominent spot in our hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening.